Thanks everyone, my name is Jeremy Singh and I want to talk to you about transplanting optimizations from one virtual machine to another. Um, this work was done with, or probably by, my PhD student, but he's just submitted his thesis and he's now lying on a beach somewhere. <laughs> Before I start, I want to um, um, issue a quick advertisement. So, um, I don't know how many of you are based in the UK or visit the UK, but we've just received a big pot of money to set up a ManyCore network. So, what we're doing is running uh, meetings three times a year on um, interesting topics in terms of compilers and virtual machines and runtimes and so on, and other topics too, to do with ManyCore. Um, all the kind of major industry players are on board, like Microsoft, maybe Oracle as well, Tim Harris is involved, and people like that. And uh, we'll be running workshops, and I'm going to try and spam as many of you as possible to come along and visit us in sunny Scotland to um, join the, the Medicore network activity. So please look out for that in your um, spam folders. Good. So, here's the um, top line of my story. Like, virtual machines are everywhere. And if this was a trendy talk and I knew how to import lots of groovy graphics, I would now give you lots of pretty pictures of, you know, Duke and um, lots of other exciting logos for virtual machines. But instead I thought, let's be more scientific about this and let's have a look. This is only slightly more scientific. Let's have a look at programming language popularity rankings. So I went to your three favourite programming language popularity websites and found out that the number one language in the most recent ranking of each of these websites is indeed a kind of virtual machine based language, possibly Java or JavaScript. And if you look at the top 10 languages, oops, lazy, for each of those things, quite a few of them are virtual machine based languages. I wasn't sure about C Sharp. Sometimes it compiles to native executable code, so I didn't include that. If you include C Sharp and maybe Swift and things like that as well, then actually you find out that the majority of popular languages, by some rather um, dubious metrics, are virtual machine languages. So virtual machines really are ubiquitous. There is lots of diversity in terms of virtual machines. So I was asking our OCaml Java friend before, you know, which VM you run on, and just for a single language, there are lots of different virtual machines, aren't there? And then, if you think across all these languages, there are so many different VMs. And I just want to um, consider for a minute these two possibly contrasting philosophies here. So the first one I'm going to call the Tolkien Oracle philosophy, <laughs> which is one VM to rule them all. And I think the idea here is that you have a capable, high-performance back-end that you kind of hook multiple front-ends onto, and then you compile down to this um, highly optimizing compiler system that does lots of groovy code generation stuff in the back-end. Um, is that an appropriate um, characterization of Grahl and things like that? Possibly, yes, okay. So you've got an optimization infrastructure with lots of different uh, front-ends. Okay, then I'm gonna call my second um, philosophy here, the kind of Chairman Mao stroke Google philosophy. And the idea here is that you've got loads of different development teams working on loads of different virtual machines and they probably never even talk to each other. Is this true? No, we talk. Oh, do you? Oh, sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm doing an injustice. So you talk to each other. So kind of the dark guys talk to the V8 guys who talk to the... It's a lot of fun. Okay, good. Okay, so I, I take it back. But the point is you're all working on rather independent infrastructure, I think. Is that true? That's, yes, okay. Yeah. So a range of virtual machines to uh, target a range of languages and platforms. So I think these are two um, possibly um, opposing uh, attitudes to VM diversity. So, what's the problem with virtual machine diversity? I suppose, in some sense, what we're doing is duplicating effort, right? Okay, because here's me over here with VMA, and I've got my cool garbage collection infrastructure. And here's me languishing over here with my kind of stop the world, mark, sweep, garbage collection. I think, if only I could use all that cool garbage collection technology over there. And, of course, if you port it to MMTK and things like that, then you could use lots of groovy optimization infrastructure and so on. But the problem is, there's duplication of effort in these diverse uh, runtimes, okay? So you have to actually implement the, the algorithms to do the optimization for what you want. And if you don't, then you're missing out on optimization opportunities. Oops. So, here's the big idea for this... Um, slightly hypothetical um, position paper, I suppose. Is it possible to share artifacts between diverse virtual machines in order to improve the runtime performance of programs running on those VMs? And I'm going to suggest that it is possible. 
So first of all, let's think about what kind of artifacts we might want to share between two distinct VMs. Okay, so here's a table here of possibilities, and I think this is not an exhaustive list of, of kind of artifacts. Do you want to share information? For example, say you've got a, um, a, an adaptive compiler, right, and you're looking for hot methods. Well, it could be you've got you know hotspot running over here, and you've got Jake's RVM running over here, and this one here is you know generating its, its database of hot methods. Could it somehow share that database with the other virtual machine, and then you know that would need to go through a war because it already been warned up by somebody else. That's one possibility. So being, I suppose, promiscuous with your profiling information is the idea there. Um, Perhaps you could share this at a slightly higher level here, an idea, so somebody says, aha, let's do generational garbage collection, somebody else says, great idea, why don't we do that too? And in fact, in my very short paper, I talk about how the Ruby developers kind of agonised for a while about whether or not they should do generational GC, and then they did, and they just kind of, you know, used all the ideas in the 80s, 20 years later, and everybody else. Okay, then the third kind of artifact that we might want to share here is an implementation artifact, and this is actually what I'm going to show um, in the, the results I'm going to report, preliminary results I'm going to report here. And what we're sharing here is an inlining heuristic. Okay. And what we do is we take the uh, heuristic from Hotspot and embed that into V8. So, first of all, we need to find out how to um, discover this kind of potential for optimization. Okay, and I'm going to use a technique that I have called horizontal profiling. So you might be aware of uh, Matthias Hausberg's work on vertical profiling, and the idea there is that you look right the way down the stack of your runtime infrastructure, starting at the high-level application events and going all the way down to microarchitectural events, and you try and cross-correlate these things to find out optimization opportunities or missed optimizations. Okay. With horizontal profile, you do the same thing, but instead of one stack, you've got two stacks, one for each runtime, okay? And you run the same thing as much as possible on both these two stacks and look across them and see what um, quantitative differences you can discover. So we are going to execute a common set of benchmark code on distinct virtual machines, that's our two runtime stacks, and compare their non-functional characteristics in some way. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to compare um, Hotspot Java code with uh, V8 JavaScript code. And we're going to use the computer languages benchmark game, micro benchmarks, which I know you're shuddering and thinking about these are Italian represented. But lots of other people have done it as well fairly recently, including some people in this room, I think. So I'm, uh, not, <laughs> I'm not alone in this, uh, this scene. Okay, good. So um, let's, let's drill down. Oh, so I suppose I should just justify that. So the reason why we want to use a macro benchmark is because there's um, effectively functionally equivalent algorithms implemented in a range of different languages. Okay, so it's like the Rosetta Stone, effectively. You know, you've got your Egyptian hieroglyphics and your kind of classical Greek next to each other. And they say the same thing. Only here we've got our kind of, you know, Java bytecode and our, you know, whatever, um, Ruby or Python or whatever. And it's exactly the same algorithm implemented in different languages. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to run the same benchmark in these different languages on each VM. And we're going to selectively turn off optimizations one by one. We're assuming here independence between optimizations, which is a little bit dodgy, but we'll, we'll gloss over that for now. So we're turning off optimizations one by one. So for instance, I might say, right, let's turn off constant propagation, and right, let's turn off inlining. We turn them off individually and see when the performance of the benchmarks we're executing degrades. And if performance slumps suddenly, we know that this optimization is really important for this benchmark on this runtime. And the interesting thing is, listen to this, sometimes performance degrades more when you turn off a critical optimization on one VM than it does on another. And then you say, well, that VM for which the performance degrades more must have implemented the optimization better, perhaps. But let's see. Hmm. Here is a rather unintelligible heat map. So on the vertical axis here are some of our benchmarks. Okay, so we've got here the binary trees benchmark there. Um, there's a, a, a regular expression, a DNA string searching thingy, there's the N-body program. And then down here on the horizontal axis are my different optimization passes that I can turn off one by one. So if you get out your telescope, you might be able to see that this is people optimizations here, this is um, um, uh, 
uh, loop predicate, something or other, splitting blocks, and somewhere there's inlining there. Good, okay. So you can turn off these optimizations, and the squares, the color squares in the middle, indicate what happens to the program performance relative to the default set of optimizations switched on. When the square goes red, that means this benchmark goes particularly slowly when you turn off this optimization. Okay, so you can see here that when you turn off inlining, pretty much everything, well, most things, let's say, go quite slowly. And um, here's a benchmark here. Whatever you turn off, in most cases, it goes slower. Okay, some benchmarks, nothing seems to make much difference. So look at, excuse me, oh, mantle dropped there, and you see that actually none of the optimizations seem to be doing anything. It's such a kind of trivial benchmark that none of them seem to make much difference to it at all. It's, um, I suppose, um, optimized by hand by the uh, developer before it's uh, submitted to the, uh, the, the kind of bytecode interpreter. Okay. Some optimizations, look, if you turn them off, the thing goes blue, which means it runs faster. That's interesting. And the reason why is because these are actually such small programs that the overhead of doing the analysis isn't matched by the benefit that comes from the form of the optimization. And as it, suppose you see that kind of thing called very small benchmarks and optimizations that aren't really applicable to those small benchmarks here. Um, this is the heat map for Java benchmarks running on Hotspot. Okay? And here's a very similar heat map for JavaScript benchmarks running on V8. The same set of benchmarks implemented in a different language. A similar set of optimization passes. We tried to do a mapping, but you can't really map one to one between optimization passes in different compilers. I mean, some of them are the same. So here, for instance, is use inlining, and you see that when you turn off use inlining, <coughs> things slow down. Um, there, which meant what? There's K nucleotide there, and there's Mandelbrot. So for Mandelbrot, here sometimes it does slow down when you turn off, for instance, liveness analysis and so on. So we can see actually that. Um, V8 seems to be more sensitive, perhaps, and slows down more as you turn off these, these optimizations. But um, we can uh, see, in, in some cases, interesting things here. What I'm going to do for the last five minutes of my talk is show you two interesting uh, results that we derive from these, these heat maps here. So these are case study optimization transplants. So the first one is we are going to add a new regular expression processing library to Hotspot. Okay, and the second one is we're going to change the inlining optimization in V8. Okay, so one is transplanting something from V8 to Hotspot, going one way you see, and the other one is transplanting something from Hotspot into V8. Okay. So regex DNA, one of these um, benchmark game programs, runs faster on V8 than Hotspot, which is anomalous because for most of the programs, they're like Mandelbrot, and they run basically three times faster on um, Java Hotspot than they do on JavaScript V8. This is on the same machine here. Okay, right. With, with regex DNA here, you see it actually runs about four times faster on V8 than it does on Java. And the reason is because um, inside V8 there are um, um, intrinsics to handle particular regular expression um, um, operations which aren't supported inside the Java util regex library. Okay. So you can see that this is a zoomed in version of that V8 heat map before. When you turn off regular expression optimization, regex DNA slows down dramatically on <coughs> V8 because you've you know stopped running these, these, these intrinsics here. Okay. So is it possible, would it be possible to add better intrinsic support for regular expressions to Hotspot? And we thought about it, and we didn't. What we actually did was put in a, a, a better performing um, regular expression library into um, Hotspot. This is the Bricks library here. We ran our benchmarks and found, so here's the original Java program that runs in 200 milliseconds. When we change the regular expression library, now it runs in 150 milliseconds. So it's still not as fast as JavaScript with its iRegX library, but it's faster than it was before. Ideally, what we want to do is port this library here into Java, but my poor PhD student ran out of time. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, second optimization. <coughs> That's future work. Second optimization is inlining, right? Okay. And we found, and this um, correlates with other people's uh, work as well, that inlining is the most important single optimization across all benchmarks for both our virtual machines, as indeed other people have found for their VMs as well. Okay. Um, we found that when you turn off inlining, Java benchmarks performance degrade more than JavaScript. 
Okay, so could we somehow improve the, the inliner inside V8? So look, is inlining turned off? The performance is worse, it slows down dramatically. This is the binary trees benchmark in Java. Same in JavaScript, so you turn off inlining and um, inline constructors, and again it slows down dramatically. So um, the, the point is Hotspot has a more sophisticated inlining algorithm V8 because it supports recursive inlining. So uh, here's some C code, maybe C plus code for you. Right, so um, Hotspot um, kind of goes through the, the kind of caller tree and um, um, increases the, the inline level if you've got kind of um, recursive inlining and then you've got this amount of recursive inlining you're allowed to do, otherwise you don't inline. Whereas V8, if you see any recursive inlining, it just returns false and doesn't let you inline at all. So we added a, a max recursive inline um, a constant to um, V8 and now allow recursive inlining if it's constant. And we see that when the constant set to 1, the performance improves slightly for um, I think it's the same binary trees benchmark here. But as the recursive inline level goes up, the performance improves. Okay, so three questions just as I finish quickly. Thank you, Stefan. Is optimization transplanting possible? Yes, in limited circumstances when you kind of twist the thumb screws on your PhD student. Mm -hmm. Is optimization transplanting useful? Possibly one can squeeze out some better performance, and maybe even better than we did if we did it more. Um, rigorously. Is optimization transplanting legal? Well, I think this depends on your kind of source code and licensing and there's some kind of issues there. But I think we're okay at the moment because Hotspot's GPL and what's V8, I don't know. But anyway, no matter how many it's like, okay, I think. Um, and then the challenges are data structure mismatch, so different intermediate representations in the different compilers, how do you kind of port between those? And is it um, feasible to automate this transplanting. So this has been done for graphics programs, people transplant things between various um, um, graphics manipulation programs and so on. Martin Minard and his gang at MIT do that kind of thing. Is it possible to transplant code automatically between virtual machines? I leave that to the question for the audience. Thank you. Well, BA is definitely for, for non -stat, non statically high. Mm. So, uh, is there any issues you have to consider to, to trans transplant the <coughs> BA optimization to the DBM optimization or vice versa? Mm. Um, at the level at which we've been looking at things, um, we haven't found <coughs> anything at the moment that would uh, not be appropriate, I think. But I guess the, the dynamic typing is um, an issue that we'd, we'd come across if we tried to uh, perhaps select an optimization that wasn't um, um, equivalent in the kind of statically typed world. Yeah, is there anything in particular you're thinking of? Well, not very much now. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, I think heuristic functions like the one you picked with the mining, if the VMs would abstract them properly, you could easily exchange them. Also the regex engine was ported also to Dapium with not a whole lot of effort. Ah, so that's interesting. Yeah, okay, so there's there, potential there's some there. isolated components that yeah. really well. So they're kind of very standalone, kind of yeah. loosely coupled yeah. components. I think so usually, usually if you work in your so yeah, by the eight, you don't think about how to make it reusable, but yeah. for your it totally makes sense if you program it how you learn it at the university. Right? Um, I'm wondering though for GC, I have a hard time uh, seeing how you could um, translate that because that typically um, uh, collaborates really closely with the object model mm -hmm. and to get it really fast you really want to take mm -hmm. advantage of the object model and this sure. one is optimized for fast startup time or sure. high throughput or low latency sure. so there I think it's going to be really really hard to yeah so I kind of wiggled around that one by saying you can transplant ideas rather than implementation so there you just say you know ah that's a cool trick for your concurrent GC let's just kind of uh, port the idea rather than the implementation so yeah I know sometimes you have to kind of bail out and say it's not possible to have a direct mapping between these two concepts and these two runtimes yeah yeah, yeah. one more because well in some sense JavaScript is pretty close to Java in in the sense that you know they support only very limited reflection. Oh so yes, reflection. You know, okay. VM because well, VA is very different from JVM. Mm -hmm. But once once the you know, types are 
dynamically obtain some by using some runtime information, mm -hmm. then the rest of the things would be the same. Optimization with respect to the optimization. But if you or suppose you have a Ruby VM mm -hmm. in which uh, types are not really static. Static. Yeah. 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 You know, you, there are there are many chances to be updated by some by using a reflection. So in that case, in that case, you still have to invalidate the optimization. Yeah, so say. then mm -hmm. the optimization heuristics, I mean, in sorry, in line heuristic will right. be very different from the rest of the law. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments? Um, future work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. So I mean, in some virtual machine infrastructure, it's possible to de-optimize. You know, and I think we might have to. We haven't really looked at that yet. We might have to try and hook into the de-optimization de kind of infrastructure as well and kind of trigger the optimizations when our assumptions are invalidated. So my, my honest impression was that the trans transplanting the optimization techniques from, let's say, uh, yeah. the grays to graph. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. 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 But otherwise, <laughs> well. So um, both the VMs you chose were architected by the same guy. Ah, that's interesting. Um, well, yeah, so that's right. If you pick, are they two, different or not? If you pick two that were done by different people. Yeah, if you look at the source code, it does look remarkably similar. <laughs> so if you pick two that were done by different people, you yeah. think this would be a lot harder. Okay, quite possibly. Yeah. So again, future work. We need to do this for more VM. But uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. That's a very salient observation. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I just started turning off uh, yeah, each optimization one by one and see the runtime. But have you studied, this is just curiosity, uh, the size of the binary generator? For example, you don't that. I mean, like, obviously, for some... The reason, size of the, the code, the yes. actual code. Yeah, instead of the runtime. Yeah, so what we did was, um, with the, these heat maps we've got here, where have they gone? Um, these heat maps here are for runtime, but we also generated heat maps for kind of eye cache misses and things like that. And you can see the effect that the optimizations have on all right. these micro architectural metrics. We generated thousands of graphs, my only picture two here to show you. So we do have that information. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you did you run the JavaScript benchmark series like the standard ones like Octane or Kraken? Uh, I would be curious what happened to the to the total number with the uh, in learning heuristic from Moscow. Yeah, okay. We'll try that. We haven't, but we'll try that and uh, get back to you. How's that? Maybe call your PhD student on the beach? Right? Yeah, <laughs> I might <laughs> disturb my <laughs> sleeping <laughs> PhD students. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I have more of a comment. I think, Mario, maybe you can set up because you're next. Um, it's a comment and, and it sort of fills in the middle of the spectrum. You sort of contrast two different approaches, right? Mm -hmm. There is a middle ground, a little bit, oh, yeah. middle ground yeah. which is uh, what OMR project is doing, right? The IDM's sort of V9 um, DM refactoring, which is that they have an implementation that they try to slash into reusable components yeah, okay. that other languages can sort of pick and choose from. Yeah, okay. You've got to pick and mix beer. There's not very many efforts like that, but just for completeness, I just wanted to mention that okay. there, is, there is a bit of a middle ground. Thank you.